welcome for this new session. I hope you all had a great coffee and you won't fall asleep in, in the middle of this, this one. Uh, so I'm Arthur Legal, I'm director at KA, so one of the partners of this project, and I'm here with Joseph. Uh, so we are going to present that together. Um, and what we are going to discuss is the interactions between arts and policymakers. So we are it's a bit of a different take compared to what we have discussed earlier, but it's actually a bit, um, it's clearly linked. Because the starting point of all this sort of, why do we need to bridge arts and policymaking was that the questions that we discussed this morning, the questions that we raised throughout arts formation are big questions. They are important topics, they are, um, discussed by artists in various ways, but they're also discussed by policymakers in very different ways. So what we tried to do was to sort of look at the different approaches between um, artists in a broad sense and policymakers and see if we could sort of bridge the gap in terms of where these topics are discussed, how they are discussed, and is there any sort of common ground that we can establish. So that was a bit, oops, that was a bit the idea. So what we'll do today is to share a bit the results of what we have done, um, discuss a bit the insights we have found throughout the arts formation projects and discuss the critical issues that we've seen as well. Um, we have done quite a lot of things in terms of consulting artists, policymakers. So the idea is also to look at the, the different perspectives and see where they come together, if they come together. I'm not going to spoil the results of, of, the, of, of this presentation yet. Um, one important thing as well that we should say here is that this project, um, the, what we did for this project was really to create some sort of open dialogues between policymakers and artists. So we tried also to create this common ground ourselves. We tested this in various workshops as well throughout the project. And um, look, then we will also look a bit at future prospects in terms of shaping policymaking through uh, an artistic lens and how we can make um, digital society more inclusive as well in the future. Um, so that's a bit what we are going to discuss today. And um, it's quite an open space as well. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to raise your hands um, and we can take the question right away or we have also foreseen a bit of time to discuss this more deeply. So um, we had a sort of dedicated work stream in, in, in arts formation, looking at the policy aspects. And we looked at three main things. So first was to understand why um, collaboration between artists and policymakers was not necessarily happening uh, naturally. So we looked at different challenges, different opportunities. So understanding really um, what are the different contexts in which artists and policymakers could interact? What are the uh, specificities of this context? Does this challenge evolve on a local basis? Does it evolve because there are different ways in which, um, let's say, policymakers design their policies and have different types of consultations, interactions with, let's say, civil society as a whole, including artists, of course. So we looked at these challenges, opportunities, and then we sort of tried to um, map, let's say, both priority areas. So where is, is it easier to um, have the artists engage with policymaking and also best practices? What is actually happening in the field and um, what is working a bit better than, um, uh, than anything else? Um, and then once we had done this sort of kind of mapping, understanding what's going on uh, type of work. We then set out to develop our own tools and also our own, let's say, impact indicators to understand how to better, let's say, capture the value of interactions between the arts and policymaking. So that's a bit what we set out to do. And that's where I leave the floor to Joseph, who is going to run you through the main results of that. Sure. Um, thank you, Arthur. So, yes, as, as Arthur was mentioning, the first thing that we did was uh, to take a look back and to see what was has been done already in the past. And, well, it was very interesting to, to see and to start this presentation with this piece from the 80s in which already it was uh, uh, raised that the 
uh, the collaboration between artists and policy makings is something that was not taking place. And even before this digital transformation, it was something that uh, it was already looked for. Just to give you a, an idea of like uh, where we started and, and for how long this topic has been researched. Um, but basically, what I think it's, it's, it's interesting to highlight and it's an important differentiator fact of our research is that we look to this interaction in a process-based uh, approach. So our interest was not so much on looking at uh, artistic pieces per se and, and to see what these artistic pieces impact policy making, but to look at the process of interaction, of collaboration, of, uh, of conflict as well between the artist and the, and the policy maker. And this allows us basically to define the roles, to define the missions, and to see beyond a mere, um, a mere artistic output. Um, in doing so, we started to um, differentiate uh, different modalities of these cooperations from top down to bottom up, more external or more internal, more uh, output based or more process based. And with the idea of, uh, at, the end of the, at the end of the research, developing a typology to map the different types of roles that artists take in the policy making uh, process. Um, as you will see, all of these modalities end up uh, being uh, converted into a typology that was derived from a mapping done uh, through this research of I think around 60 practices of interactions between artists and policymakers. And we come up with these five main types from the most, let's say, external uh, part, which would be probably the hacker or the mediator, to the more, let's say, internal um, internal uh, placement of the artist vis-a-vis -vis the policymakers, which would be the in-house artist. Um, I will not run you through all of the types, but maybe just give you a bit of example so you could you can understand better what are we talking about. Um, the in-house artist is this role that is um, quite rare, we have to say. It's not very common to see this uh, nowadays in uh, policy institutions, in governments, both at local, regional or international level. But is this artist that is full on uh, ingrained in the policy design process. So be it as, a, as an equal, like that is possible to work in an equal to equal terms with the policy making process. So in a horizontal way, and it's not based on a simple project, but has this more of a long-term collaboration. And here, uh, the best example that I think exists in Europe and worldwide is the UK Policy Lab, which is a, department of the British government that uh, it's very small, it's very exploratory, but it's exactly doing this. So bringing on artists and then giving them training to, uh, uh, to uh, equip them with policy relevant skills and policy relevant knowledge to, and then basically placing them in different uh, cabinets and different uh, departments. Now, there is also here in Europe the New European Bauhaus, which is uh, still an embryonic uh, initiative set up by the, this commission, but that I think um, in the future, in the horizon, is, it's trying to do something like that. Of course, in a much, probably in a much more uh, bigger uh, context, but it's, it's trying to uh, contribute to the digital transformation to the green transformation with these aesthetic or beautiful uh, tools. Um, let's say maybe another uh, type, another type of, of, of role that we have identified is the consultant, which in contrast with the in-house artist is a much more short-term collaboration. It's project oriented and, and we see that the agency of the artist here is always reduced by a set up objective and a set up policy agenda, but still it's well equipped to, to work, to work with resources, to get paid and so on. And here um, we put the work of uh, Valentin Godard, which 
is both uh, an artist, but is also has policy relevant skills and knowledge because she's a lawyer and she basically uses artistic uh, approaches to develop methodologies to debate issues around data, data ethics and AI. Um, the third uh, type that we think it's most relevant is the hacker and this is the one that has been uh, more spread throughout this mapping and is and is and is and is the type in which the artist has uh, the greatest let's say artistic freedom to act because it's not dependent for a into a contract or is not dependent into a, a, a policy agenda but is also the one in which the artist finds itself in a much more precarious position vis-a-vis -vis the policy making because it has to act external to the policy team and this of course um, doesn't make it possible to to directly work with the policy relevant so it, it's about changing public opinion it's about uh, creating and finding indirect ways to contribute to policy objectives and here we put the uh, the example of uh, Bramon Bramon which is a French agency that um, it's very well known to to to, to take policy relevant issues and to basically self-commission themselves work vis-a-vis -vis, uh, public agencies. And, and this is what they did with this uh, work of public action in 2017. Um, well, so after this, let's say, typology that we uh, division, we wanted to come up with this set of indicators in order to capture the impact and basically what um, the process that we did is what somehow reverse engineer um, the, the typology. So we we got these five types. We saw what was working, what was not working for each of them, um, based on whatever conditions that they were uh, um, structured, and somehow we derived an ideal type. So we we said, what is the best case scenario in which an artist and a policy maker can work together? and can uh, achieve the greatest impact. And from this ideal type, um, we, we, we saw that there were basically four main categories, four main dimensions that um, they had to be looked at, which was relevance, inclusivity, capacity building, and sustainability. And these four dimensions allowed us to uh, ask, let's say, uh, guiding criteria questions as, as how much um, inclusive is this policy and this artistic practice, how much um, skills is the artist uh, uh, learning from this process, how, how sustainable is this practice, are we looking in, into a short term or are we looking into a long term? And basically from these uh, four uh, dimensions we were able to, to, to derive the questions and the uh, measuring methods and then of course the the impact framework assessment and of course this all holds up very well in our um, uh, let's say theoretical research but then as Arthur was mentioning we've thanks to our formation we've been able to um, confront these ideal types these typologies with other policymakers and other artists and we Thanks to these workshops, we've been able to identify uh, deep barriers that basically prevent this cooperation and, and this work. And, we've, and, and we have come to realize that these barriers are mostly shared both by the artists and both by the policymakers. And they can be, let's say, a divide between a structural barriers. So, much more in a material sense and then interpersonal barriers so taking care of uh, the lack of trust the, the language divide the institutional clash that we can see between artistic practices and policy making practices and of course uh, we as a as a as a policy design um, research center we uh, have come up with uh, potential recommendations to 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 safeguard these uh, key barriers. I don't know, Arthur. Yeah, I just wanted to add a bit on the key barriers here because I think it, it, it's quite important to to understand also what we have done in, in order to come up with that. Because 
what we've done is indeed a series of workshops and consultations with both artists and policymakers, and we tried to several formats as well. Some of them were sort of only with artists, some of them were only with policymakers, and we've also had workshops like combining the two um, uh, sides, let's say. And what's interesting as well is that first, the, 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 well, we try to have a sort of equal footing approach, basically, when, when gathering everyone in the same room. So we try to really have this, this whole level playing field that we are discussing. We try to sort of even it out. Um, but even so, the other barriers didn't necessarily magically disappear either. So what's important to um, consider here is that those barriers are not necessarily something that are addressed quite easily and it takes quite a bit of work um, in order to overcome, overcome them. So when we look at policy recommendations, etc., we should be aware that this is not something that will change overnight as well. It's a, it's a process thing as well. And it's also um, something that needs requires a step-by-step -step approach. Just wanted to flag that as well because people who haven't necessarily been involved in these consultation phases um, uh, might not realize as well that these, um, let's say, we kind of tested these barriers already. So just something I wanted to add here. Yep. And so, so they are potential and of course humble policy recommendations. As Arthur said, it's it's about the process. This is the main research focus. I think that Arts Formation has uh, taken into this field. So um, the recommendations are, um, let's say, directed to, to, to develop more sustainable, more inclusive, more fair uh, uh, processes vis-a-vis -vis both the policymakers and the artists as well. In the artists, of course, like there is um, traditional, let's say, recommendations that the whole cultural and creative sector share, like uh, reducing the complexity of bureaucracy, uh, making available more funding opportunities and so on. But um, these also have an impact onto the capacity to, to influence policy making. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and something quite important as well in these recommendations, so uh, both for policy makers and for artists, is that um, we, both sides are not necessarily starting from the same position as well, because um, it's the role of policy makers to make policies. It's kind of their job, uh, hopefully. Um, Whereas for artists, engaging in policy making is a different task altogether. And it can be that it's sort of concomitant to their work, but in most cases it won't be. And it's sort of additional um, kind of task. And that's why also the, the stuff recommendations are um, a bit mixed in, in this sense. So um, some of them are really about creating a space, but it's also about sort of creating the necessary conditions in order to a bridge this difference in perspectives, in role, and in terms of uh, also where you sort of coming from and speaking from, I would say. Oh, yeah. And we've sort of, okay, but that's the general idea. And then we try to make this a bit more operational as well, because um, it's all great, but uh, what does it look like in practice? So um, what we are doing is coming up with different sets of situations, scenarios, and trying to analyze what's the sort of arts and policy making, um, let's say, relationship, depending on different set, set of criteria. So here we, we are taking kind of fictional, but really relatively realistic scenarios. So here we put in the middle sort of artistic practice, which would be an artist looking at data, artistic data interventions in order to combat fake news. So that's, she's developed an, an, a whole art practice around that. And, um, and, and she, she has developed a set of artistic interventions. And of course, as you know, fake news, the battle against fa fake news, it's something that matters from a policy point of view. You've got different regulations looking at that. You've got different program funding, quality journalism, for instance, as well, media literacy, you name them. So that, that's already out there. And the idea was to, say, to look at um, how these various policies can, to some extent, um, 
combine their policy approach with the artistic approach of the artist. We called her Sarah, and we can discuss why we called her like that as well. Um, <clears throat> so we developed three scenarios where um, each time the basic principle is that there is already a sort of policy in place looking at fake news, and the artwork is challenging the vision, of the policy vision. So the artist wants to sort of be heard in terms of what her vision is bringing to this policy discussion. And we've got three scenarios. One of them is um, basically she, the artist starts working with an intermediary agency, that would be scenario one, and that specializes in bridging the gap between artists and policymakers. So that creates a clear communication, a shared understanding of each side's objectives, um, uh, and, and some sort of common ground. So that's one scenario where um, you can sort of have a sort of third party which is sort of bridging the gap between the two and um, navigate established common languages, uh, navigate bureaucratic complexities, etc., and securing resources as well to develop the uh, artistic practice into something that has a policy impact. That's one scenario. Scenario two is sort of uh, the art, uh, trying on its own, so, sort of um, trying to establish common ground with policymakers, but the language gap is too big and the cultural differences persist. So there is a discussion going on, but this discussion doesn't lead to much because both sides stay on their position. So that there is a sort of partial collaboration there. It's it's there, but it doesn't have a lot of policy impact. And the third one would be really the fake collaboration model whereby um, this discussion is, does not lead to any effective communication. So when we look back at the example from before, like the hacker where um, the agency was developing a sort of alternative vision to public policies in, in France, to the roadmap for public policies, a more desirable f future. Well, if that sort of vision is not somehow um, properly communicated to the ones who are designing these uh, policies, well, then it doesn't lead to much in terms of policy impact. And here it's a bit the same issue. If, she, if the artist keeps, um, let's say, um, developing its own vision in parallel to the policy making space, then the impact on policies will be uh, largely um, uh, minimal. So that's a bit the sort of type of things we are looking at. So developing different scenarios and looking at how that can be addressed in different ways using um, the approach we have developed in, in previous slides and we have explained. So we are developing different scenarios like this to look at how um, collaboration can lead to policy impacts in different ways. Okay, so that's a bit what we, we, have, we have been working on, what we've been doing. And now we would like to discuss that a bit more openly with you as well. Um, we are also happy to sort of go back to some of the slides. We might have gone quite quick to, on some, quickly on some of them. Uh, so if you have any questions on that, we, we are happy to um, go back to them. Uh, but otherwise, we'd like to discuss a bit with you as well, because you're all coming from different positions as well. Some of you are more leaning towards artists, uh, artistic practices. Some of the, you are more policy makers. Um, but there are a couple of questions we listed here, namely um, the role of the arts in informing and shaping policy, which is more the, the sort of starting point. And also perhaps looking at your own experiences here, what aspects really resonates with you and with how you worked um, in the past. So we've, but, and also looking at the barriers we've listed, which ones are most critical, why, and how can we improve that? So um, we've got two ways of doing this, and we are going to do both. Uh, so one of them is you simply um, raising your hand, and we, we are happy to open the discussion. Or if you'd rather do, do, do it um, digitally, you can go to mentimeter.com and use the code uh, which is listed, uh, which is mentioned here, uh, written here. Or you can also scan the QR code if, if that works better for you. Uh, and there you will find the different questions and, and, and different possibilities to answer. All good? 
Does anyone want to skip that QR code and take the floor directly? Yeah? Go for it. In the meantime, we'll look at, yeah, at what's going on online. Hi, thank you. Nicholas Froh, um, I'm a professor at the University of Auckland and uh, UNESCO chair in dance and social inclusion. I, I, I've got, I'm a bit concerned about the premise that's presented within this that is perpetuating this idea of the artist as an identity and, and a very homogenized one, which is deeply Eurocentric and neoliberal and, and, and modernist when we're trying to consider how complex the arts are in society. So it's kind of been dropped a bit from lots of subsequent UNESCO policies. And we're, we're looking much more at things like how does the arts itself be manifested amongst lots of people, with, amongst anybody, rather than trying to identify its a stage of particular individuals. And this is particularly because artists themselves are very complex. They're not all some sort of ethereal being that's untainted by society, and they have a whole complexity of different political agendas. So I guess we've moved more into a space of saying, well, how do we ensure that creative practices, creativity, aesthetic considerations can all be informing this space, dependent, regardless of who is bringing that into the policy decision-making space. Um, but then when we are looking at bringing different groups like artists or policymakers together, um, theories on transdisciplinarity probably really extend the discussion a lot further beyond just these are the problems of these individuals to saying what do you need to do as an organizational unit to enable equity, symmetry within collaboration, co-design um, from the outset and not just sort of a participatory view. And I think that should be much more foregrounded within any policy recommendation that's moving forward rather than just sort of saying, oh yes, we need to have the artist in or we need to have that and we need to have a much more complex approach to the integration of artistic sensibility within policy making. And I'm also just a bit concerned about the, um, the recommendation that we should include arts education. It's almost like it, that in itself perpetuates hierarchies existing within the arts that put artists up here and educators here and community educators here and a whole variety of things. That would seem to be nonsensical. Anybody who's working in arts education is inherently an artist as well. So why that's even presented seems peculiar as a, as a statement. So I'm just throwing a lot of this back because there's a good space here for advancing the media, but I think it needs to consider those issues in, in its framing. I think it's, well, I, I can make a short answer, but I think it's probably a longer discussion as well. But perhaps one thing I, I should mention is that um, it's a bit of, we, we, we use artists and policymakers as a sort of tag, but there is kind of quite a lot of complexity behind that. Um, what we did take on board during the, the whole approach was the role, especially of, let's say, collective and intermediary organizations, let's say, so collectives, be the artistic, well, be the representative of artists, but also uh, different cultural associations, etc., and even civil society organizations. It's true that probably one point we didn't really sort of take into account was the first thing you mentioned, which is basically how, um, what's the impact of the arts within broader, let's say, co within wider community groups, and how that ref then translates into policy making. That that is probably one space we didn't really explore throughout the project. The rest is more okay. When we talk about artistic practices, it's 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 also how they are sort of taken up through a various network, cub web of organizations, and um, which is also creating some different spaces between policy making and, and artists per se. So. We use artists, but it, we, when we use th that word, we don't necessarily have in mind the individual artist doing something. That's that's uh, that's true. However, the, I think you raise some some very important points in terms of the more diffuse um, impacts of the arts in, in in society and how that then translates into um, um, policy making discussions. We, I'm, I need to think about this and perhaps talk to you a bit for a longer bit. But that, thanks a lot for bringing this up. Oops, sorry. Oops. 
Hi, uh, I'm Deborah from uh, Radiona and I'm part of, uh, from Zagreb, Croatia, and I'm uh, part of advisory board, the same as Maiken. Uh, uh, I'm very happy that you are from the United States because I had this... Uh, New, Zealand. New Zealand, I'm sorry, oh, even far away. No, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, this is the part of like comment, no question, yeah. Uh, what I wanted to say is that as a former also policymaker, um, uh, I think it's interesting to see, uh, first, there is always a broader context, yeah? To see uh, when we um, make a relations between the artistic sector, art sector, cultural sector, and policy making. So these things are usually, they sometimes, they, they don't speak the same languages in a sense. When there is a possibility to make some kind of transformation is basically when we get people who were part of a cultural sector becoming policy makers. This is when you get people understanding the context you know, much from the different perspective. This is sort of like anthropologically looking culture from inside or from outside, yeah? The second thing that has been interesting and for me, it's always like looking at the United States because they, the resilience that is happening there is quite different because there are no ministries of culture, yeah? So whenever there is some kind of crisis, it's great to see this on the horizon, you know, because it's quite different than the European uh, sense of, because we have some kind of, institutions and also even not like the Anglo-Saxon and your social policy you have in UK, Scotland, Ireland. But what I, what I find really, really inspirational in the sense of like inclusion and bottom-up approaches uh, be, in creating policies on your own and artistic practices and community practices is for instance in America, Teaster Gates. Yeah, it's been such an uh, you know, I don't know how many people are involved with his practices, you know. He's been basically an artist who's bought at one point, you know, the, the real estate, the house, and decided to create his, not just his own studio, but also like the community cinema, uh, the gallery, the library. This is for me the way how, when we are stuck up with the policy making, we decided to create them. So I think why I like having this kind of creating um, the, 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 the aspect of getting to the commission is a one point. But when we don't have it, then it's okay for me to create on your own. Create your own spaces uh, and make your own, let, let's say, policies and social practices, yeah. Of course, it's quite a different point of view, but this is what, what would be interesting to see, to check up also like how these examples in United States or in New Zealand, as you said, I'm sorry, or have been created on their own, their, their, their own uh, entities, yeah. Thank you very much, so I'm sorry for, I just, yeah. Thanks a lot. And I, I think we, we, we did have some discussions around that at, at a lower scale, of course, because the example you gave is, is of course, quite, quite a big one. But you, you do have that when we, we mentioned the issue of, for example, conflicts, and we saw lots of artistic, well, our cultural practices that were actually um, kind of what we call a bit the hacker type, that were, that were actually developed in opposition or at least in parallel to public policy making, whereas they were touching upon the exact same topic. The reasons for that can be different. It can be that uh, there is a sort of, there is no common space to discuss, so actually you develop the project in order to actually develop a dialogue or just independently because you want to have uh, that conversation from your own, in your own terms and um, it's impossible to do that through normal, let's say, interactions with policymakers. You actually develop a, an artistic intervention, you develop a community project. It, it, it really depends. There are many shapes and shades of how this is, this is done, but that's actually probably one of the most common type of interaction or rather lack of interaction between arts and policy making, uh, I think. And that's also something we sort of, um, and perhaps that's something we should have said from the get go. It's not that we sort of hierarchize this. Um, we do have a bias, which is we want these interactions to happen in a sort of common ground and safe space. And we feel that it's very much not happening at the moment. So that's also why we, we have this weird approach, which is to sort of almost force cooperation in a way. Uh, but that's a bit the experimental approach that we wanted to take as well. Because of course, it, 
And it is perfectly fine, of course, to have this sort of um, non-dialogue, forced dialogue, this kind of things. But we feel it's not necessarily the most healthy relationship in the, in the long term. So that's also why we have this bias in the way we approach things. Yep. And and just to add, yes, of course, uh, the, our mapping did not involve US and American-based practices. So of course, there is a global context that we need to take into account. And as um, you said before, of course, artistic and artist and art are words that need to be uh, deconstructed and we cannot reduce to a simple category, the same as policy making as well as you said. Of course, policy making takes shapes and forms in different scenarios. And in the US, there is this issue of like not having the, the cultural minister and, and then civil society plays a different role than here in Europe. So, of course, this also is much taking into account. Um, I'm wondering whether you have looked into the artists like acting as activists, working with people that share certain matters of concern and they move together to actually, like for example, there's a project called Sensing with Justice in which the artists actually help to develop a court case, things like that. And also in this way, it's actually influencing how they look into environmental regulation, etc., And also it's not like, oh, they're behaving as an advisor or hacker, but actually they are also activists. Um, but not every artist has this kind of dexterity to use that kind of language to communicate with policymakers. So somehow I'm wondering whether you look into this kind of infrastructural channel that will allow more citizens participating in policymaking together with artists or other social actors. Is your question related or not necessarily? Okay. Yeah, that, that's an excellent point. Thanks a lot for raising that. And it's something we are probably going to discuss a bit afterwards. But yes, um, we didn't necessarily look into that as part of the initial phases of the research, I would say. What we are, but we are certainly looking into that as in terms of um, next steps kind of things. So that's, we are looking in different directions. One of them is probably the sort of collective movement that enables to overcome some of the barriers uh, that we identified. So be it lack of uh, the language barrier, namely, because the collective movement can sort of act a bit as a translator in a way, uh, but also lack of resources uh, because by pulling together, um, by sort of coming together, then you 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 mutualize the work and resources, etc. But what you're hinting at here is probably a bit different. It's more kind of artistic intervention to enable dialogue per se. So not necessarily driving the artistic narrative or partly doing so, but more, more, more artists as an enabler of public discussions, right? That's a very interesting point. And I think that we should probably look into that a bit more because that's not necessarily the area we've explored the most, I would say. So I'll, I'll look into that. We, okay. <laughs> I think I need to have meetings with quite a few of you afterwards because I think, I think we want to take on board more stuff now. Yeah, uh, sorry, you were first and then, yeah. But I was just, I, I think it's very, very, very important to have this discussion. So I just want to say thank you for your work. I think it's, uh, of course, we need nuances and I agree with everything that is, that is being said. And I just wanted, because I was actually thinking of the same, this role of activist, because um, at least in Denmark, where I'm from, uh, the artists are actually driving sort of the, um, the ecological, uh, sort of revolution that is somehow happening or they're trying to make it happen. So I think this activist uh, category is somehow important. But I also see it as a continue, continued dialogue that, that, that is very sort of important for this project, that it, it doesn't only happen in silos, but that it happens in many different, on many different levels. So thank you for that. Thanks a lot. I, I can only say that, yeah, this continuous discussion is certainly something we are looking into and we are very interested in doing. I'm looking at the cable. Um, yeah, let's see if we manage to reach you.
Yes, uh, thank you for your uh, work and the presentation. Uh, just to reflect on the second question, what aspect resonates with your own experiences? Um, so I'm a consultant myself as well, and I also happen to talk to quite a lot of policymakers. And um, it has been researched as well, but it's not um, uncommon that policymakers have an artistic background or an artistic training, professional training actually. So it might add another typology, so the in, inside artist policymaker kind of also it resonates to the, well, how it is already inclusive in a way and something maybe you can also add to the research. Yeah, yeah a good, good point. And uh, interestingly, I think most of the policymakers that got involved in the, in, in the process, in the various workshops, all had the sort of artistic background, either as uh, professional, let's say, education, or just as a hobby or something. But, but, but of course, I mean, it's not particularly a surprise that um, most policymakers working in the field of arts culture um, are, always have a sort of um, appetite to, let's say, this, uh, this sector, let's say. So, but yeah, that, that's definitely a good point. And, and that, and I think uh, also that can go to different extents because, of course, there is a, a difference between a policymaker, policymaker playing guitar in his room and someone who has really had an artistic career in the past and, and, and so on. And I think that's probably something we can look into as well um, in the in-house, uh, so bringing a bit of nuance to the in-house uh, category. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I I wouldn't. Well, the, there is a a bit of a discussion around probably cultural kind of capital. I don't like this expression, but uh, there is probably something to to look into. All, and also because the policy making uh, area is quite fluid as well. You can jump from one um, ministry to another, for instance, and you, you've got different things around that. But but yeah, that's. I I haven't looked at this sort of background of uh, policymakers in general and see uh, what, what's the sort of um, uh, cultural background of, of, of policymakers. I'm not sure there, there is a research on that, but uh, we can look into that. We can think of it at least. Well, I'm, let's see what we managed to do within the end of the project as well, but yeah. That's okay. Um, I think uh, just following on from that, one of my questions is about this element of time that artistic practice and artistic thinking evolve over a period of time through the person's career, but often policymakers, like you say, kind of move from different sort of either civil service departments, uh, move from different areas of focus. And what is the kind of, how have you factored in this element of time in your research? Because um, often the only way to develop a shared language or build a sense of trust between people who come from slightly opposing or not uh, or just different fields is to factor in a lot of time uh, an artistic practice certainly needs that benefit of, of support through time and sort of allowing that space to develop and think more holistically um, and I guess for me in the earlier panel we were talking at you mentioned this idea of design thinking in relation to uh, some of the other kind of aspects of AI, but I, I guess here maybe we're thinking more about artistic thinking, so it's less about uh, the kind of design and, and construction of policy, but more what does artistic thinking bring into different spaces, which then feeds back into your point originally about not fetishizing the artist um, and not fetishizing uh, the person, but more that, that process of thinking and that process of, I guess, what does artistic thinking bring into different approaches of work, which obviously is only possible with the dimension of time. Thanks a lot. And, and, and I think that that is certainly an, a very important point. And we did discuss that, like, also coming from the policymaker point of view, because um, that Again, we, 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 we say we use artists as a sort of umbrella tag for many different things. Policymaker is the same because um, it includes different things. It includes law making, which can be both a very slow and very fast process. And, and of course, 
um, there was a big issue there when you look at how laws are made. There is a very often a sort of quite long um, sort of preparation phase, but then the actual, let's say, um, decision making, and I'm not say, tell, is talking about the official decision making process, but the when the de decision is actually made in, let's say, cabinets or in this kind of things. And this is a very fast paced and free, uh, environment. And clearly, it's very difficult to have a discussion space at that point because, first, because the f elected officials has very little time. We experienced it as well in, in the consultation phases. And so it's very difficult to have a proper conversation then. So it's more about the overall process and the overall um, let's say open spaces between um, policy making and, and, and the artists and uh, how the messages get through overall let's say in a more diffuse way in, in, so it's not necessarily um, if, if I had to let me sort of put it in very uh, plain and, and, and almost stupid terms but it's not like uh, an, a, a, parliament, uh, a member of the parliament meeting an artist when he has to make the decision on the next budget. That's, that's not what, what we are talking about. It's more about, okay, how the whole, um, the whole narratives that is developed throughout an artistic process can somehow be, um, let's say, be involved in the whole discussion process of policy making. How does it, how does this narrative sort of gets heard in different phases of making a new law or making a new policy, etc. And, and, and that's more what we are looking at. Uh, so, yeah. So what I can say is, uh, yes, there is very, that's a very important question. There's no real definite answer to that. But we do believe that the if there is an answer, it lies somewhere in this sort of more open and equal footing discussion space uh, that we, we mentioned earlier. I'm not sure that was very clear. <laughs> uh, anyone else wants to pitch in? What does the digital world say, if anything? It's not responding very well, so we will no, no. But we will include all of the responses in the in the report for sure and share it. But uh, now it's it's not connecting well. But just coming back on the time, indeed, in our impact assessment framework, there is the dimension of sustainability, which looks at uh, long-term versus short-term collaboration and, and how, indeed, that's it's one of the main barriers to collaborate. Okay, so if there is not more questions, we are happy to give the mic to Segolin. Yeah, one more thing, as, as we say. Yeah, just, just to, to give you an, a sense, because we it's a bit weird, we have this final conference, but we still have some next steps as well, because one, one of the things we did realize throughout the consultation processes is that there is a sort of uh, need for more collective work on this, and that's a bit the, the, the sort of next steps we are thinking about, so um, sort of finalizing, wrapping up a bit all the findings we have and taking them to different spaces. So one of them was actually created within Arts Formation with the Artists' Assembly. Um, and, but there are other spaces where this dialogue are sort of emerging. So, for example, Culture Action Europe is now doing um, work in terms of engaging uh, the cultural sector in the next uh, European elections, for instance. So there are a few pockets where... Um, this kind of, which are trying to develop this open discussion space we, we mentioned earlier. And so one of the things we still want to do um, as part of the project or slightly beyond its duration is to f further engage with these um, initiatives and, and to sort of confront a bit what we are, we are doing and what they are doing and what uh, the whole arts formation community uh, have done, in fact. So that's a bit what we have in mind. I'm not going to deep dive into the other points. I think that that's, that's fine. Yeah, you want to say something? Because I, I was kind of wrapping up anyway, so, um, so I'm happy to take one last question or remark, of course, oops, without taking everything on the side. Yep. Yeah, you inspired me with that slide there. 
so before this, I had no intention of speaking. But yeah, um, speaking of collective uh, uh, collective action and uh, empowering the artists, etc. Uh, what, uh, if any, findings and any relationships with uh, artists' uh, unions? So pretty much trade unionizing the artists uh, have been uh, in, say, the European space. Because, for instance, in Ireland, it has been only a couple of years now that we have an actual artist union doing the collective bargaining. Yeah, we we did talk with um, artists engaged in, in, in union movements, uh, especially from Italy. There was a, a movement there. And, and that's an, actually an interesting thing as well. Um, the cultural sector is very poorly unionized. There are lots of cultural associations, lots of networks, everything. But when it comes to trade unions, uh, sorry, um, to unions, there are very few of them. Uh, and that's also one of the structural issues when it comes to getting to a sort of um, equal discussion space because those spaces are structured by, um, for example, um, collective bargaining agreements, let's say. Well, if you want to do that, you need to have a union, you need to have a, a sort of... Um, you need to have the employer on board uh, as well, and you need to have the policymakers. And in the cultural sector, well, you don't necessarily have an employer, you don't necessarily have an employee, and there is no sort of discussion happening in the normal structure of things for, um, in terms of labor law, for example. So that's, that's indeed one big barrier as well, and, and that's why we, we sort of also try to hijack a bit the normal discussion spaces. But thanks a lot for raising this. This is an important, very important point. And I see Sigolen is jumping out of her chair. And uh, so thanks a lot, everybody. And uh, enjoy your lunch. Exactly. Wonderful. Thanks a lot to you. Uh, lunch is in the area in front uh, where we had coffee. And uh, we resume here at 2.30.